Jerry, Sam Jer Jerry Sampson. Expansion. Expansion and non-extraction. Well, non-extraction, this is one of the biggest controversies in the history of dentistry, in the history of orthodontics. Can we expand the lower arch, and why is it called the diagnostic arch, and expect a stable, reasonably stable results given the teeth shift with age. It all shifts with age. Uh, I'm uh, living proof of that one. Let's take a look, you and me. Over the past few decades, it seems that the pendulum of extraction, non-extraction has swung rather radically towards non-extraction, sometimes to the detriment of the patient. Well, one of the sayings that I like a great deal is from Dan Gilbert, that belief systems always beat facts. It makes very, very little difference what the science is. It's what people believe to be true because belief systems seem to not require facts. Of course, unless we intend to approach orthodontic treatment with some basis in science. Well, that area that we are going to discuss right now is the controversial expansion and arch length gain. Bear in mind that in dentistry, in orthodontics specifically, this has been over 100 years, a century of argument about extraction versus non-extraction. Arch length gain through expansion. Now, by the way, if you would like to read something quite remarkable about happiness, I highly recommend this book, Dan Gilbert, Stumbling on Happiness. It will alter the way you think about what makes you happy and what makes everyone else happy as well. Controlling the crowd, extraction, non-extraction, and well, the uh, rather gut-wrenching borderline call, should I or should I not extract? These um, religious beliefs go as far back as this fellow right here. That would be the father of modern, modern orthodontics, Edward Hartley Angle is quite a, a young man, and you can tell by the countenance here that um, Angle is convinced that he is Edward Hartley Angle, and you obviously are not. Now, what happened long after Angle was dead was that a new power came in in the form primarily of Charlie Tweed. And then the lower arch started being referred to as the diagnostic arch for these reasons. First, and perhaps, perhaps foremost, as compared to the maxilla, where there are numerous viable sutures during growth, the mandible has no viable suture past birth. So basically at the time of birth, the midline suture that was there is no longer very useful at all. It's essentially obliterated at birth. Next, if we're going to play, pay attention to science, every study that I'm aware of is that expanding permanent cuspids of the lower arch, remember, expanding past the upright position has been shown to be the most unstable thing that can be done. Now, when someone tells me that they can translate cuspids and keep the canines upright as they expand them, past the upright position. So just imagine the canines have been moved to an upright position on the lower arch, and then the individual claims that they can translate those and keep them upright. Well, I have yet to ever see that done. Um, in any case, this has been shown to be an incredibly unstable thing to do, and uh, permanent retention would be indicated. Now, this also does not take into, into account any fragile periodontal structures that could be on the facial. In addition, the lower arch is described as the diagnostic arch because the mandibular dentition is essentially trapped by the maxillary dentition or maxillary arcade. This is normal buccal overjet and normal anterior overjet. That is a limitation. Now let's take a closer look at this idea about uh, medial lateral expansion and gaining arch length. In fact, there is an article that refers to this by Nicholas Germain, published in 1991. But let me make this uh, perhaps easier to um, absorb and a bit more amusing. 
Now, for real, you do not want to miss part two. It's serious, okay? Hmm?